Hello, this is Jason Williams, and today we're going to discuss intraosseous catheter placement. Today we'll discuss when to place an IO catheter and situations to avoid IO catheter placement, how to choose the right site. We'll talk about placement technique as well as when to consider analgesia and how to do that, as well as how to safely remove the catheter when you're finished with it. Finally, we'll talk about complications to monitor for and how to prevent them. So the most common scenario for IO catheter placement is in the code setting. One institution compared their use of IO catheters and central lines in code situations, and not only was IO catheter significantly more successful, but when a central line was eventually placed, it took up to 10 minutes compared to an IO catheter average time was just a minute. And because of this, ACLS guidelines now recommend if your peripheral IV is inadequate during a code situation, you go straight to an IO catheter. It's faster and much more successful than a dirty central line with somebody just stabbing away in the groin in a non-sterile way, which is probably not safe for the patient, but also not safe for those in the code situation with those sharp objects flying around. Other important scenarios to consider IO catheter placement is in the setting of shock. So if you're having difficulty getting a central line or if there's going to be a delay in getting central venous access in order to place pressors, you can put an IO catheter and start pressors right away. And then if it takes you two hours to get a central line, you can do it under a much more safe setting with normal blood pressure as those pressors are going in. Trauma settings commonly use IO catheters because you can give rapid blood transfusions as well as volume expanders. And status epilepticus, if you have someone that's in status and really needs IV medicines to break that seizure, it can be difficult to place an IV as the arms are contracting tonically and clonically. So you can place an IO and get their Ativan or Phenytoin in if needed. It's important to know IO catheter is really only designed to last about 24 hours. Uh, and so it's just a bridge to another vascular access device, whether that's a PICC line or another central access or just a peripheral IV. But it could be a life-saving bridge in those emergent or urgent scenarios. So when to avoid IO catheter placement? So if what you're infusing into the bone could potentially leak out, you should really avoid placing a catheter in that bone. So if you have a fracture of the bone or if you've already poked a hole in that bone by attempting an IO catheter, you shouldn't re-attempt IO catheter placement. Here's an example. Somebody was using too short of a needle to try to get into the tibia. They drilled in, the needle fell out. They drilled back into this bone again, the needle fell out. And they drilled in the third time, and this time it's stuck. But then when they infused pressors in, it leaked out of those holes of the cortex, out of the bone, and into the subcutaneous tissue, causing soft, soft tissue necrosis. So if the cortex of the bone has been violated for any reason, either an IO catheter, fracture, or pre previous orthopedic surgery, don't put an IO catheter in there. Choose the contralateral site or a different bone altogether. Uh, it's important, if you can't palpate your bony landmarks, don't blindly jab around. Uh, you don't want to place the needle through cellulitis or an abscess either and introduce an infection into the bone causing osteo. It's important to remember these aren't MRI compatible either, so if you need to get an MRI quickly, an IO catheter may not be the best option. All right, the two most common sites for intraosseous catheter placement are the proximal humus and proximal tibia, and there's trade-offs between the two. Proximal tibia is much easier to feel that bone, so the success rate is much higher. And in a code situation, nobody's really using the knee, so it doesn't fall out as much. The proximal humerus, on the other hand, it's much deeper bone, it's under the deltoid, so it's harder to feel, so you're more likely to miss. And during a code situation, with chest compressions and uh, airway management, there's a lot of congestion up around the head of the bed, and so it can be dislodged potentially during code situations as well. There are some benefits to the humerus, though. Uh, it can tolerate a lot more fluid per hour. You can infuse a lot of fluids faster, and it's a lot less painful. And pain is not determined necessarily during needle insertion, but it's the rate at which fluids are infused determines how painful the catheter is. And so you can put a lot more fluids into the proximal humerus in a much more comfortable fashion compared to the tibia. So patients that are conscious in less urgent, less code situations, proximal humerus might be a better option. Whereas a code situation, you need to be in and fast and be successful. Proximal tibia is probably the best option in those scenarios. To find the site for humeral insertion, use your two thumbs to palpate deeply and slide up the humerus until you find the head of the humerus. It'll feel like a golf ball sitting on the T, and where the golf ball and T meet is the surgical neck of the humerus. About one to two centimeters above the surgical neck is a bony prominence called the greater tubercle as marked by a red X on the right side, and that's the area where you insert your IO catheter. The tibia is much easier to find the landmarks. You just go below the kneecap and find the tibial tuberosity, and then just go a centimeter or two medial to that. You'll find a nice flat plane of bone to work with. If you're having trouble feeling the tibial tuberosity, just find the bottom of the kneecap and go down about two finger breadths or three centimeters, and then just go another finger breadth medial to that, and you'll be in the right spot. 
The equipment you need includes a chlorhexidine, non-sterile gloves. The level of sterility is about the same as placing a peripheral IV. You just need to sterilize the skin and keep the needle itself sterile. You need to choose the right needle. You need to get your drill or driver, your dressing, and your IV extension tubing, as well as a saline flush, and consider lidocaine in conscious patients. Consent the patient if they're alert and oriented. Scrub the skin with chlorhexidine to sterilize the area. The next thing is to figure out which size needle you need. There's three different sizes, yellow being the longest, the medium size being blue, and the shortest being pink. So the way to determine this is insert the needle through the skin and try to touch the bone. So in this case, there's so much subcutaneous tissue that this medium-sized blue needle can't touch the bone, and as a result, it's going to be too short. This is more ideal setting. They grab the longer needle here, the yellow one, push through the subcutaneous tissue, or able to touch the bone, and they see one black line. And that's your goal, to see one to two black lines in above the skin as you're touching the bone will tell you you have the right needle length. For instance, you wouldn't want to use this yellow needle on someone in their tibia that has very little subcutaneous tissue. You'd probably see three black lines. And if you had a lot of needle out here and tried to drill through, you could potentially go out the other side of the bone. So you don't, you don't want to see more than two black lines. But you want to see at least one black line as you're pushing through the subcutaneous tissue and touching the bone. Once you've selected your needle, then use your needle driver and squeeze the trigger and the needle will start to spin. Apply moderate steady pressure. Advance the needle about half to two centimeters. You'll note a loss of resistance as you move through the cortex of the bone into the trabeculum. And after the catheter is inserted about a centimeter or so after that loss of resistance, stop squeezing the trigger. And you want to be sure that the hub of the catheter doesn't hit the skin because you could potentially spin this into the skin and cause some abrasions. So try to stop before that catheter hub touches the skin. Then you can remove the inner stylet. That needle here shouldn't be wiggling around at this point. That'll help tell you it's seated in bone. Don't wiggle the catheter though. You don't want to disrupt the bone and cause microfractures of the trabecula. Then you can apply your dressing, attach your extension tubing, and then attempt to aspirate blood. It's these two steps that tell you you're actually in the bone and confirm placement. The needle shouldn't be flopping around on its own and you should be able to aspirate blood to make sure you're in the bone marrow cavity. If you can't aspirate blood, that could be normal. You still may be in the right spot. The bone marrow itself is like jello. It's hard to aspirate through. So attempt flushing the catheter first, and after that flush, it may liquefy that jello-like bone marrow matrix, and then you may be able to aspirate and confirm that you're in the bone marrow and not in the subcutaneous tissue. It's important to consider lidocaine in conscious patients. It's not the insertion of the needle that's painful, but the actual infusion of fluids. The periosteum has a lot of nerve receptors that detect the stretch of that periosteum as the fluid's going in. And normally those mechanoreceptors are stretched when the bone is breaking. So as you flood the periosteum with fluid, stretch that area, it can feel extremely painful during infusion of fluids. You shouldn't use lidocaine if the patient has any heart disease. So whether it's SA no dysfunction, any AV block, even first degree AV block, uh, severely reduced CHF, or uh, a history of porphyria. And even moderate CHF or moderate bradycardia or shock, you know, you could worsen the cardiogenic component of their shock. It could precipitate seizures or myasthenia gravis flares as well. And be careful in hepatic or renal impairment as the doses are likely to be elevated in those cases. So if they don't have any of these contraindications, take 40 milligrams of 2% preservative-free and epinephrine-free lidocaine and slowly push it in over two minutes. Then let that lidocaine dwell in the trabecular bone for about a minute and then slowly flush the saline. Then you want to give a more rapid saline flush of 5 to 10 mils. That'll help liquefy that bone marrow and create a nice cavity for your medications to be infused in. And then you can start infusing fluids. It's important to use positive pressure during infusion because the bone is somewhere between venous and arterial. It actually has a mean arterial pressure of about 30. So if you don't have some positive pressure to push fluids in, you're not going to be able to run a bag of saline. So use a positive pressure bag or a positive pressure pump. Uh, and if you're still having trouble infusing fluids, give another flush and that may liquefy that bone marrow and give you more space to infuse. When you're done with the IO catheter, grab a regular lure lock syringe, twist and pull straight out. Be sure not to rock or wiggle that needle as you're being pulled out. You don't want to disrupt or cause microfractures to the trabecular bone. Complications, we talked about pain and considering lidocaine in conscious patients. Failure rate, we talked about as well. It's really important to monitor for dislodgement because that could cause extravasation of infusion into the sub tissue. And if those oppressors, it could cause necrosis. Or if it's a large volume of fluids, you can get compartment syndrome, especially in the leg, as seen here in this photo. 
So in conclusion, always consider IO catheter, especially in code situations. We really shouldn't be placing dirty central venous catheters in the groin anymore in codes, given the prevalence and ease of IO catheter placement. Contraindications, always ask yourself, if I put a needle into this bone, is the fluid going to leak out of the bone into the sub tissue? And if so, choose another bone to, to insert the catheter. We talked about the trade-offs between humerus and tibial selection. Always remember to select the proper needle size. Confirm needle placement that it's in the bone by being able to aspirate blood. Consider lidocaine cautiously, again, to reduce pain in conscious patients. And be sure to flush your catheter and add positive pressure, or otherwise the nurses will have trouble pushing or infusing uh, products in. And again, always monitor for extravasation, especially in the first hour of infusion, to make sure you're not pushing fluids into the sub-Q tissue on accident. And that's it. Thanks for, for listening to this presentation. Hope you have a great day.